It's a winter of discontent for Britain. Hundreds of thousands of public sector employees are going on strike this month. They say they've had enough of low wages and rising living costs. How should the government respond? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Deri Nabogeda. Britain is facing at least a month of unprecedented strike action this winter. Hundreds of thousands of public sector workers are walking off the job. The situation has become so serious that the government may ask the military to help keep services running. Security guards, teachers and staff from the postal and rail services across the UK are planning days of industrial action. So are up to 100,000 nurses in coordination with ambulance and other health care employees. They say decades of low pay and poor working conditions have left them unable to deal with the rising cost of living. The government described the strikes as unnecessary and has urged unions to call them off. But union leaders say they don't have a choice. We have members who are sleeping in cars because they can't afford the petrol to go to work. We have members who are having to rely on food banks. And when I say members, I mean nurses working in hospitals are having to rely on food banks. The reality is that the strike wave that we are seeing is a direct result of a cost of living crisis where workers can't make ends meet while companies are still making huge profits. And this is in the sixth richest country in the world. Workers do not take strike action lightly, but they do not have any choice. And I think increasingly, workers are thinking, why should they have to pay the price for an economic crisis that is not of their making? So how did we get here? Well, research by the University of York suggests about 45 million Brits will struggle to pay their energy bills this winter. UK inflation reached a 41-year high of 11.1% in October as the price of food and fuel soared. And Rishi Sunak, the third prime minister this year, is grappling with an economic crisis and a recession predicted to last well into 2023. Economists have blamed the war in Ukraine and the knock-on effect of the pandemic and the aftermath of Brexit. Let's now bring in our guest joining us from London. We heard from him a little earlier on is Unite the Union's National Lead Officer Unai Kassab from Longfield in Kent. We have Claire Pearsall, who's a Conservative Party councillor, and also from London, Naeem Aslam, Chief Market Analyst at Avatrade. Welcome to you all. Thanks so much for your time. Uh, Claire, so it's being described, uh, as you're very well aware, as the winter of discontent, reflecting uh, perhaps the 1970s, some people say, where pretty much everybody uh, seemed to go on strike. Would you say that's a fair description of what the country is facing? It does seem to be a fair description of what we're currently facing. I just can't help thinking that these strikes are completely unnecessary. And in your clip, your my other guest here on the show has stated that his members cannot afford the cost of living crisis. Well, it is going to affect everybody. The cost of living crisis isn't just hitting those industries. It is also hitting everybody in the entire country. And what the strikes will do is put more pressure on those families who have to get to work by other means. If they cannot use a train, then they are going to have to drive. The cost of petrol is so exorbitant at the moment, it is going to put even more pressure on those individuals. And with the nurses striking, all that is going to do is increase the backlog into the NHS. I think the public now, their sympathy is elsewhere. They just want their lives to be undisrupted even though they understand the meanings behind the strikes. OK, let's bring in Unai Kassab, who we heard from earlier, to comment on what you've had to say. Unai, go ahead. The reality is that the strikes are absolutely necessary because people do not have a choice. And if you look at the wide breadth of people involved in these strikes, then that really sends uh, the message. As trade unions, we are always willing to negotiate and strike action is always a last resort but our members now do not have any choice we have a situation where our members are going through a cost of living crisis while at the same time employers have been making record profits when you have a situation where people are relying on 
food banks, where nurses are relying on food banks, where people are sleeping in cars, where people may be losing their own homes, where people who work for the state have to rely on state benefits, where there are families who dread the school holidays because quite often that is the only time where their children can get a hot meal. That tells you a lot about the situation that we are in. The fact that people have voted for strike action and we have met the thresholds that are set by the law that make it, in some cases, quite difficult to actually have a legal vote for strike action. The fact that we are getting those ballots through tells you everything. People do not want to take strike action, but are being forced to take strike action because of the situation that we are in. The other thing to make very, very clear is that this isn't just about a protest. We know that strike action wins. Over the last year, since the election of our General Secretary, Sharon Graham, we've been involved in over 450 disputes, separate disputes, winning the vast majority of those and putting around £200 million in extra earnings into our members' pockets. So the conclusion is that the strikes are necessary, our members don't have a choice, and our members know that strike action works, and that's why we are going through what we're going through at the uh, at the moment. It's a cost of living crisis together with a profiteering crisis. OK, I'll come back to you. Company. I'll come back to you and we can drill down on some of these points. So let me just bring in Naeem Assam uh, from London to just comment on the, the what the uh, Conservative Party chairman, Nadim Zawahi, had to say. And he said that it is the wrong time to strike over low pay because it would help Vladimir Putin divide the West. What do you make of these comments? In the midst of everything, politics is the main reason. The politicians and their stance is the main reason why we are here in the first place. We have self-inflicting injuries in the United Kingdom, and the current consequences are very much the results of that. Because if you compare the cost of living crisis in the United Kingdom, compare that to France, compare that to Germany and the rest of Europe, i.e. the EU, you will see, in, even in terms of subsidies for electric, you will see the clear difference, or in terms of a surgeons in, in terms of electric, bill and you compare that with Germany or with France or with Italy, you, you can see the results over there. So, you know, <clears throat> taking the political angle on the back of this one, what we, from an investor's perspective, from an economic perspective, we need more certainty. We do not need a political environment where you are flaring up another geopolitical uncertainty, which Currently, and sadly, the government is pretty much doing that by picking up another war with the second biggest economy of the world, China. We wanted to have, from an investor's perspective, investors like to see more certainty rather than uncertainty. And that can really sort of mitigate all the concerns in relation to cost of living crisis, in terms of economic growth, in terms of inflation. And one of the panel members have mentioned you know, earlier that yes, the situation is actually going to get worse. It's gonna get a lot more dire going into 2023. Because remember, if anyone, was paying in uh, in, uh, in terms of the mortgage for 1.7 to 1.5%. Now the current rate on the market is between 6% to 7%. So your mortgage payments are gonna be more than doubled. And in London, we have hundreds and thousands of those mortgages, which are really gonna be kicking in the first Q1 of next year. So, I mean, I, I am very much sympathetic with the current situation or what is happening, but and we just hope that the government can shape up some right policies in order to mitigate the current circumstances that we have. Okay, Claire, what does the government have to do at this point? Well, I think the government has negotiated most recently as today, and that offer has been rejected uh, by one of the unions uh, regarding train strikes. So I think that we are left in a really difficult position. If the offer is not accepted, the strikes are going ahead, there is nothing else the government can do. And what worries me is the effect this is going to have on the economy, 
on people's employment states. If they cannot get to work, they cannot earn money, they cannot feed their family. The knock-on effect is enormous. And especially at this time of year, those industries that were hit really hard regarding the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns that we suffered in the United Kingdom are going to be hit doubly hard coming up to the festive season, which is normally their busiest time. So I would hope that the unions will get back round the table with the government. I think that they need to work out where their differences lie. And the unions cannot keep demanding such an enormous increase in the pay, uh, pay and uh, conditions debate where that, without looking at what the financial position of the United Kingdom actually is. They may well have to come down on their offer and the government may in, in fact have to increase theirs. But at the moment, I think they've gone as far as they can. Unai, tell us uh, the union's position on this and um, whether... Uh, there could be a possibility that they actually do come down on their offer. Has the government done enough for the unions, in your opinion? Uh, uh, the government has done nowhere near enough. If we just take one example with the ballots that are taking place for NHS workers, the government is refusing to negotiate and indeed doesn't negotiate. We go through something called the pay review body where people make a submission and then just the government and the body decide what offer they want to make after that, uh, that pay review body has met. Rather than that sham of a process, what we need is negotiations. And that's not happening in England, as far as the NHS is concerned. Now, in Scotland, where there are negotiations that have taken place with the Scottish government, it does seem as if there is some progress being made there. And look, Claire made the point earlier on about the impact on businesses of, of, of strikes. But here's the reality. Unless you pay people a decent wage, they cannot go out and spend the money at Christmas anyway. That's the reality. They cannot go out and spend the money as part of the hospitality industry and go out and enjoy themselves because they are not being paid a decent wage. And as far as the UK economy is concerned, Unite Research has found, and it's on our website, we've produced research using figures from the ONS and what figures are available from, to us from... Uh, company accounts that show that the large companies, the major companies in the UK, have made 75% increases in their profit margins between 2019 and 2021. Uh, That's bigger profit margins than they were making prior to the pandemic. So the argument really is that there is money there in the economy. And our view is that the wrong people have got it. They've got too much of it. And it's about time we started discussing how we redistribute that. OK, let's bring in Naeem. Is there money really there, Naeem? Because some people worry that if workers do get pay rises, then their employers will in turn have to put up prices for customers. That pushes up inflation. And then you have sort of a never-ending uh, spiral. Is that a correct assessment? Is there money, but is it just in the wrong hands? <laughs> If you look at the quarterly earnings, the most recent quarterly earnings, what we see is we see an increment of supply chain in terms of the input cost, whether that is on the labor side or whether that is on the actual ingredient or on the cost structure. We've seen that. We've seen the, a large number of companies suffering from their margins. So what they did, they've increased their prices. To give you just a very, very simple example in the, in the UK, especially in London, and I've, I've used this so many different times. You know, like a basket of eggs for 30 eggs used to be three pound. Now it's, it's seven or eight pound. Meat used to be seven pound. Now it's 15 pound. Now people who are struggling, struggling with paying the bills, and then we're going to have a really cold winter on, on top of that. How are they really going to afford this? Not to mention their mortgages. So going back to the original question, so if the companies have already increased the, the product cost, and that is actually feeding into inflation. And what you were referred to earlier, you know, 41 years high. Of course, it is your cost for a fuel, and secondly, the input cost for those ones. So because of that, they've increased the margins. But who is actually paying? It's the act normal person, the consumer walking on the street is actually paying for that. And then they do not have enough money coming in. Disposable incomes have actually completely eradicated because of the government's policies or what they have done.
Uh, Claire Pierce, I'll weigh on this. I mean, do you think that there's enough money to combat the situation, but it's just concentrated in the wrong places? Well, I think if you look at chain operating companies, then they do make um, an enormous profit. But that's not for the government to tell them what to do with it. Those are private companies. So I take exception to that. But I would also like to point out with the NHS Pay Review Board, they are there for this kind of purpose, to have a look and see what is a fair pay across the board. If you start demanding something which is 5% above inflation, now that is completely unworkable. It is completely unreachable. So you're never going to have that kind of conversation because immediately neither side is going to win and you would just walk away. So I think that negotiation actually just does need to be better in that respect, but also use the pay review board for what it is there for. But Claire, but let me put this uh, to you because Francis O'Grady, who's the outgoing general secretary of the Trades Union Congress, said that it's not just about the spike in inflation. It's about the 12 years of austerity and cutbacks to public services. So how much do you think uh, this is about what's going on now versus a general unhappiness that has been going on for a long time over the state of public services in the UK? I don't think you can blame just 12 years of uh, inactivity on public services at all. I think successive governments haven't made the investment needed into those infrastructure product, uh, projects and into the staff within these uh, public sector positions. So I think that this is government as a whole. I think you need to take the party politics out of it and look at why the state has failed to make these improvements over the last 20, 30, even 40 years. So I don't think you can put the blame solely at one person. I think government as a whole is to blame for this. And it's now going to be the individual on the street who is going to suffer enormously because they can't afford either to get out and spend money in the hospitality industry if they cannot get to work and earn a wage in the first place. Oh, nay, some say that the unions are in fact trying to harm the government and that union leaders will see a moment like this as an opportunity to show what these unions can actually do for their members. What is your response to that and how much of this could this be about their personal position versus the actual issues that their members care about? Our union is actually 100% focused on the workplace and we've made that very, very clear. We do not care what the political colours are of the party that we are dealing with. And just to give you some examples, in local government, we've had a number of disputes against both Conservative and Labour local authorities. So we do not care what the political colours are of the government of the day, of the local authority that we are dealing with. We are 100% laser focused on winning for our members in the workplace. That, that being said, it's convenient for Claire to say this is about 20 and 30 years uh, of, uh, of problems where we've had 12 years of a Conservative government. If you take what's going on in the NHS at the moment, we've got 133,000 uh, vacancies. We've got uh, PFI debt still being uh, paid off. We've got cuts. We've got privatisation accelerated by uh, this government. And what's now going on is a cumulative effect of all of those uh, issues impacting on the NHS. That's why we're in the position we're in. We are fighting for more pay for our NHS workers so that we can recruit and retain more workers into the service. That's how you're going to deal with it. You can't ignore those very specific problems. When you've got 133,000 vacancies in the NHS, of course that public service is going to suffer. And in the NHS, it's safety critical. Patients end up suffering as a result. There is an immediate fix here, which is to pay health workers a decent wage. And yes, we don't want a sticking plaster resolution. There was a medium to long term fix as well about what we do with the NHS, what we do with the economy and how we prioritise what we want to pay for. I think we do need to be looking at how we tax wealth, for instance, I don't think working people should be taxed more to pay for services. Let's look at wealth, because wealth is being made. The wealthier have got wealthier. And I'll tell you what, it's not trickling down. OK, let me just bring in Claire and allow you the opportunity to respond. And then, Naeem, I'll come over to you. Yeah, I do have to take a bit of an exception to say that uh, private finance initiatives, the PFI deals that were just mentioned, were solely down to the Conservative government, which, of course, they were not. 
And it is decades of uh, looking at what the NHS is for. So I don't think you can solely blame it on the Conservative government. I think successive governments haven't got to grips with the NHS and the problems within it. Recruitment and retention is one thing, but also the levels of bureaucracy, the levels of management involved, the mismanagement of funds within hospitals, the money that gets wasted. We need to look at the NHS as an institution and no political party wants to do that. We have to be honest. Anybody who suggests that we need to look at how we fund the NHS going forward will automatically uh, be put to one side and told they're privatizing it. That that isn't the case, but it doesn't work in its present situation. It doesn't work for the people of this country now in 2022, and it's certainly not going to work in 10 years' time. So we need to have a very uncomfortable conversation about that. And the unions do need to be involved. But I do think this is political. It is always looking at uh, what the Conservative government has or hasn't done in the union's opinion without taking into account what has come before, which has added to all of this stress that we're dealing with now. OK, Naeem, um, uh, are you getting a sense of where public opinion lies today, right now, as we speak? Because according to one poll that I read back in October, uh, people were sympathizing with those who are going on strike. But could there be a tipping point in public opinion going forward if things do get so bad with all these strikes? Is there a risk that that opinion will go in the opposite direction? I think with public and what we what public really wants is calm and they don't want any more disruption. Now, going into Christmas period, going into the de a really um strong winter period, I think these disruptions are going to create even more chaos in, for the economy and for the general public as well. Even currently, when you have to call NHS for any emergencies, if really, you, even though you need an urgent service, but you've got to be dying for some for an ambulance to really arrive at your doorstep. That is the current situation uh, over, over here. And then I myself have a daughter who's like three years old and it was extremely, extremely ill. But Again, they've just pulled put her at, at at a scale which wasn't that critical, and then they just said it to her, said to us very very uh, bluntly that look, we do not have people right now to uh, uh, we are only prioritizing people who are really really just about to to die or or or, or suffering from a death threat, uh, even though she she was like wasn't even breathing. So that's I'm just trying to give you the example or something that happened with my own personal life not too long ago. Now. There is another side of this story as well, the, and, and that is with eradicating disposable income. Yes, public is largely concerned about that, but at the same time, you go to any restaurant in London over the weekend, you will see queues and queues of people. So it's it, it just makes you think, our cost of living crisis is as high as it can be. Are we really being vigilant in terms of our spending because when you look at those restaurants, that full that there are still lines outside. And um, just final words from all three of you. Uh, just tell me if you're optimistic that the situation will get resolved in the short term. Uh, Naeem, I'll stick with you. I think that Rishi Sunak, um, if you look at the currency from the perspective where sterling is, you know, it is well off its lows from 1.033. It has certainly restored confidence in government's ability to tackle its debt right. and then put the country on track. Uh, Claire, will the country get back on track? Yes, it absolutely will. It is going to be incredibly tough, but I think in uh, six to 12 months' time, uh, we will be past the worst of this. Uh, Unai, uh, do you share uh, what Claire just had to say, or, or what do you think? We have no faith uh, in politicians. They have let down working people time and time again. We have faith in our members, and we're confident that our members are willing, ready, and prepared to take the action necessary to win decent pay increases and to save services like our NHS. OK, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Unai Kassab, Claire Pearsall and Naeem Aslam, we thank you for your time. Thanks for watching the programme. You can see it again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page. It's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is AJ Inside Story from myself and the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for watching and bye-bye for now.